past five. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, start. Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, special session. As um, you know, we are having a week long um, program uh, organized by the SK India CD or Science Forum has kindly agreed to um, share with us um, uh, Gobind Swarup's uh, life and work in this uh, talk. And uh, before we uh, start, I will um, ask everyone uh, to uh, mute themselves. Um, and then if you have any questions, we will um, have it at the end of the uh, talk. Uh, also, those of you who are in the uh, YouTube channel, you can put your questions there on the chat box and we will look at it and then um, we can convey it to the speaker. Uh, so let's start with the talk. I will um, uh, introduce uh, Jairam quickly for the audience, um, even if the um, reason we um, we are very happy when uh, Jairam agreed to deliver this talk is that we can have a very short introduction because he really does not need an introduction to the audience uh, here. Um, so uh, just for the sake of completeness, um, Jairam did his uh, B.Tech in electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur, uh, after which he went to um, Cornell University for his PhD uh, with Solpeter. And then he was in uh, Astron for um, about two years for his uh, postdoctoral fellowship before he um, joined uh, the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in 1996. Um, Jairam has uh, worked on uh, various uh, topics ranging from uh, galactic interstellar medium all the way to um, 21 centimeter. Uh, cosmology, high red shift uh, DLAs and H1 evolution over red shift. Um, he has uh, written more than 150 uh, papers and have been has numerous awards, including being the fellow of all three um, science academies of India. Uh, but one of the most rewarding thing in his life, which um, many of us are really jealous of, is his opportunity to work uh, very closely um, with Govin from uh, very early days, from his undergraduate days, actually. Um, so he is uh, one of the person who is hence very qualified to um, tell us about Govin's life and work. So without uh, taking any more time, I will um, hand it over to Jairam. Um, so Jairam, please. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so um, uh, thank you for that introduction, Nirupam, and I'm glad you talked, uh, you, you did uh, touch a little bit on my connection with Govind. Um, uh, Govind has been, of course, a very strong influence in my professional life. And in that, I'm far from alone. Uh, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, of my generation and older Govind, um, you know, all Indian radio astronomers have probably been very strongly influenced by Govind. Um, so I am, uh, um, you know, happy to be able to talk about uh, Govind's uh, work, uh, life and work. I'll say just a little bit about his biographical, um, you know, a little bit of biographical introduction. But mostly I will be talking about uh, Govind's work. And a lot of it that I will focus on, although it's, you know, from far from all the things that Govind did, but, you know, a lot of the focus on this talk, partly given the audience, uh, and partly given what I am personally most familiar with, will be on, uh, you know, his uh, contributions to building uh, infrastructure in India, particularly uh, radio uh, telescopes. And, you know, that also I feel is, you know, I'm happy, I mean, I think it's a good thing to do, uh, to talk about, um, you know, the infrastructure which he built, uh, although he did many other things, because, um, you know, we tend to take infrastructure for granted. We feel that these telescopes are there and uh, we just use them and speaking, including of myself. And it's good to remind ourselves from time to time of the actual effort that it took uh, to create these, uh, this infrastructure and the effort that it took to, to keep it available uh, for the community. I will say a little bit also about, uh, you know, towards the end, I think, of the talk about Govin's um, own work uh, in the area of, uh, uh, you know, H1, what we would now call H121 centimeter cosmology. 
And, uh, you know, so I guess uh, that will connect a little bit to the main theme uh, of this conference also. So with that, let me start. So Govind was born in Thakurwada, which is in Uttar Pradesh, uh, to, uh, to a rich uh, landowning family. And his mother uh, had wanted Govind to become an engineer. Uh, Govind, were, however, was more inclined to do science. And his father uh, agreed that he could do that. He did not do engineering if he doesn't want to. And he allowed him to follow his inclination to study science instead. So Govind did a BSc at uh, Ewing's Christian College uh, and followed by an MSc at Allahabad University. And the years uh, of his, uh, you know, of this BSc and MSc uh, sort of coincide with the culmination of the freedom struggle in India. And finally, he graduated around the same time uh, of independence, that is in 1947. And all of these, uh, you know, these momentous events, uh, or, you know, clearly, and he says that himself in his biography, played an important role in his in his thinking. Um, the other, you know, I think noteworthy thing about those Allahabad years was that he really had some excellent teachers at that time, <clears throat> including <clears throat> K.S. Krishnan, who worked, as uh, I'm sure all of you know, uh, along with Raman. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, these teachers made a very deep impact on Govind. And I think that that impact uh, was twofold. One was it mo motivated him to take up a career in science. He was already inclined towards science and this sort of cemented it. But it also uh, sort of gave him this lasting conviction about the critical importance of high quality undergraduate education. And these are, you know, the themes which he worked on throughout his life. Um, uh, after Govind graduated, he joined uh, the National Physical Laboratory and K.S. Krishnan, who had been his teacher earlier, had uh, earlier before that been appointed as the first director of NPL and um, uh, Govind joined pretty much to work with him. And uh, Krishnan assigned him the job of developing instrumentation for measuring paramagnetic resonance at three centimeters. So this was uh, you know, a new field in those days. And uh, Govind uh, made this equipment uh, to do the measurement uh, within three months um, using surplus World War II equipment, radar equipment, and also sort of try using something called the MIT Radiation Lab series to sort of develop a theoretical understanding of what it was, how things were to be done. And, you know, both of these uh, are themes that will recur uh, throughout that, um, you know, that uh, this excess equipment from World War II radar effort um, played a big role in radio astronomy and we'll come back to it. And the MIT Radiation Lab series was in fact a very, which also I think grew out of the war effort, was a very, very influential series. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a reference volume for, for decades uh, for people. And, uh, you know, we'll get in, we'll run into another reference to it uh, uh, later in the talk. Um, so Go Govind is now at NPL and he's uh, working on paramagnetic resonance. And at this time, uh, K.S. Krishnan, the director, uh, happened to attend uh, this Ursi General Assembly. In, which was held in Sydney in Australia in 1952. And several of the presentations at this General Assembly were about this new field of radio astronomy. And that actually, I think, was not a coincidence because, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Australia had been the venue for the General Assembly in large part because uh, of, you know, the exciting effort that was going on there in radio astronomy. Australia at that time was one of the few countries in the world which was doing radio astronomy. And it had already built, uh, you know, a number of innovative radio telescopes. And we'll take a look at, um, you know, some of them in a bit. But before I do that, uh, and given also that there's a public talk, I thought I'll just say a little bit uh, about radio astronomy. I should say that I'll uh, try and sort of uh, pitch the level somewhere between for an absolutely general audience and also some things for people who are a bit more familiar with uh, radio astronomy. Uh, so uh, radio astronomy itself started uh, with the serendipitous discovery of radio waves from uh, extragalactic sources. It's not just uh, not radio waves, as I've said it here per se, but the radio waves from an extragalactic source by Karl Jansky in 1931. And he, he made this discovery serendipitously when he was conducting experiments on sources of radio frequency noise. So this was in the context of a transatlantic radio link. 
and uh, you know uh, the uh, engineers wanted to understand what all are the sources of noise that could affect this link and so Karl Jansky had been given that job of identifying and quantifying and sort of characterizing noise which could affect uh, uh, long distance radio links. So he built this antenna which you can see over here um, uh, in this picture and uh, uh, what he noticed over there we're using this antenna was that uh, in addition to the normal uh, uh, interference or noise which came from various terrestrial sources there was also a source of noise which he he, he could prove uh, did not come from the earth it actually came uh, probably from the center of the galaxy and so that was the first discovery of um, of uh, radio waves coming from a source other than the earth uh, other than terrestrial, other than artificial, and uh, you know other known natural phenomena. So this discovery caught the popular imagination, uh, but it was not followed up by professional astronomers. So it got a lot of newspaper and other coverage, but the astronomers themselves uh, were not particularly interested. And that was for a, a couple of reasons. One of them was that the techniques that were used uh, in radio astronomy were very different from optical astronomy, which was the only other astronomy ex which was existing at that time. And, uh, you know, so you uh, you had this bunch of radio engineers who could build radio receivers and they could receive something. But these were not skills which you found in a typical astronomy department in a university. And the other was that there was a huge difference in the angular resolution that was achievable via optical and radio telescopes. Radio telescopes had a very, very coarse resolution. They could barely make out from where the radio source, uh, radio MA waves were coming. And so you couldn't correlate this with uh, anything that you could see in an optical telescope. And so, you know, it was hard to make progress because you had no real idea of, you couldn't really pin down what the nature of the source was because all you knew was that it emitted radio waves and it was in some rough direction. So uh, progress in radio astronomy more or less stalled until the end of World War II. And then uh, uh, a number of electrical engineers who had been involved in the war effort followed up, uh, you know, during the war effort on when they were working on radar, they had actually also serendipit serendipitously discovered other radio sources. And uh, after the war finished, many of them began to follow up on all of this. And typically they used the surplus radar equipment, which was uh, lying around. And so that allowed them to actually move uh, and make discoveries very rapidly. So I, I mentioned that the uh, the uh, uh, resolution of the radio and optical telescopes were very different, and that is because um, the uh, all telescopes have a finite diameter, and that leads to images which are not point-like, even if the source is point-like, but it has a finite size um, because of diffraction, and that's given by this particular formula where lambda is the wavelength at which the telescope operates and d is the diameter of the telescope. Optical wavelengths are very, very small. Uh, they're of the order of a few thousand angstroms, whereas radio waves could be tens of meters uh, in length uh, or longer. And so, um, you know, the lambda that you have in a radio telescope is um, uh, is is much, much longer than uh, than than what you have in. Um, in, in the optical telescopes. And because of that, the angular resolution of uh, early radio telescopes was extremely poor. They could not make out, of course, the internal structure of the radio source, nor could they actually uh, locate them accurately enough to identify what the optical counterpart was, as I mentioned earlier. And this kind of uh, sort of, you know, uh, kept radio astronomy in a little bit of a, of a box where it, it didn't really interact to, uh, at the very beginning with uh, all the other astronomies. And uh, so, you know, just continuing my general sort of uh, uh, introduction to radio astronomy, supposing you do want to build a radio telescope to match uh, the kind of resolutions that you can get with optical telescopes, how could you do it? Right. The uh, optical telescopes typically have an angular resolution of the order of about an arc second. Um, and that resolution is set by turbulence in the atmosphere. And now if you want to use uh, a radio telescope and you want to get a resolution of about an arc second, and let's say you're observing at a wavelength of 21 centimeters, which, uh, you know, for, uh, for people doing it 21 centimeter cosmology, that would be a natural wavelength. 
uh, you'd need a telescope which was around 200 kilometers in size. And just to, you know, to give you a visual idea of what that would be like, I've, I've, I've superimposed a circle of roughly 200 kilometers on a map uh, of, 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 of Maharashtra. So you can see you'll have to cover all that much area, you know, several districts, four districts in metal, and that's obviously impossible. So high resolution is obtained using a completely different technique uh, compared to optical astronomy, where uh, traditionally you just build um, uh, telescopes or you launch them into space if you want to get out of this one arc second turbulence driven uh, constraint. Uh, but instead you achieve it using interferometry. So I'm not going to introduce interferometry per se. I'm just, uh, I've got a small cartoon here. Uh, it involves uh, using more than one antenna. And all I'm trying to show you in this cartoon is that if there is, uh, uh, if you have two antennas and if you have uh, a radio wave coming in from some particular direction, it's going to hit the first antenna before it actually hits the second one, right? So there's a bit of a delay uh, before that wave front hits the second antenna. And so that means that uh, the phase of the wave as received by the second antenna is, uh, is going to be different compared to that of the first. And so you'll have interference between these two. And, uh, you know, you, uh, the, uh, uh, whether you're going to have constructive or destructive interference depends on uh, the path leg difference, whether it's going to be a multiple of two pi or, uh, uh, or, or or not, uh, and that um, basically allows you, therefore, to to accurately determine the direction to the source, right? And uh, so, if I were to just add the signals from these two distant antennas, I would get an angular resolution which was uh, not set by the diameter of the antenna, but which is set by the separation between the two antennas because the path length difference that uh, this uh, wavefront has to travel depends on the separation of the antennas and not on uh, uh, on their diameter, right? And so that's the basic idea behind interferometry and I won't actually uh, go into any more detail about it, excepting, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So ideally you need two or more antennas, but in fact, the very first um, interferometer uh, that the Australians used had only one uh, antenna. And uh, so this is um, uh, the, the, the system that they used in Australia. Uh, they uh, have one antenna, but they mount it uh, on a cliff uh, next, on, next to the edge, um, uh, near, uh, at the edge of the sea. And so that antenna over there actually receives two waves. It receives a wave which comes directly from the radio source. And it also receives a wave which uh, hits the uh, sea. And because the seawater is quite reflective at radio with these radio wavelengths, it gets reflected. And it gets reflected from the sea and it um, sort of gets received by the antenna. Right. So uh, the antenna actually then receives two uh, rays and therefore there will be interference between these two rays. And so in principle, the same thing that we were discussing earlier could be done, excepting now you just need one antenna. Right. And uh, the, you know, the way in which these two waves would interfere would depend on the phase difference between the two signals, which itself depends on the height of the antenna and the elevation of the source. And uh, for you to observe interference at all, it requires the source to be compact, because if the source is very extended, then uh, if the path length difference between, uh, you know, one point and the source, uh, the path length difference is uh, such that you get constructive interference there'd be an equal number of points at which you would get destructive interference in the source, assuming that it is highly extended. So all of that would finally just wash out and you won't see any interference. So for you to see interference, you actually need uh, compact sources. So what the setup could tell you is, uh, you know, it could both uh, tell you whether the source is compact or not, and also it could identify the direction to the source. So one of the early results that uh, this um, uh, this uh, sort of uh, C interferometer showed was that the Krabs supernova remnant um, is in fact uh, a bright radio source. So it pinned, uh, you know, a radio source to a known optical object, namely the Krabs supernova remnant. So all of these were things that K.S. Krishnan heard about when he went uh, to, to Australia to attend this RC meeting. And when he returned to India, <clears throat> he thought it, you know, it would be good to set up a radio astronomy group at NPL to start uh, efforts in this very young field, uh, um, you know, where uh, there was where things were just beginning to start internationally. 
And so he hired a large number of young MSCs who he inspired to take up this new field. Uh, and, um, you know, several members of this group actually went on to become quite distinguished radio astronomers. So NPL, in a, in a sense, is the true cradle uh, of radio astronomy in India. Um, but once he had hired uh, these people to start this uh, radio astronomy group, there's also, of course, the question now, what exactly should they do? And since no radio astronomy had ever been done in India, you know, what you needed really was for people to first get trained in this field. And so it was agreed uh, that uh, Govind, who had, uh, you know, joined uh, this, uh, you know, had, this, who had, so had moved over to this group, it was agreed that he could go to CSIRO in Australia and uh, train in this new field. So Govind left for a two-year assignment with CSIRO in Australia funded under the Colombo plan. And um, the Colombo plan, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, was the initiative of, uh, you know, a very famous diplomat called K.M. Panikar. And it provided a very significant, and I think it still uh, is on, um, funding for human resource development in a large number of fields. And, uh, you know, this is just one example of it. So Govind in Australia undertook a large number of projects. I think what he would been assigned to do was to work for three months with a number of groups, three months each with a number of groups. And one of the things which he did was to convert strip scan images um, obtained with a 1D array uh, of the sun into a two dimensional map. And that's the map which I'm showing you over here on, uh, on the screen. And uh, it was a very painful uh, project. Uh, uh, I understand that uh, Govind was uh, doing a Fourier transform using a hand calculator, and it took uh, several months for him to finish it. But you know that pain actually led uh, to something good. It led to Govind, uh, you know, trying to think of ways in which this thing could be speeded up. And uh, he came up uh, with an idea, uh, which uh, you know, for, 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 for imaging, which is now widely used in computerized tomography. Although he himself never actually published it, it was published um, by uh, somebody called Ron Bracewell, who we will uh, run into in a moment. Um, so one of the things you'll notice about this map of the sun is that um, it, it is brighter at the edges than it is at the center. So that's the limb brightening, and that had been. Um, uh, you know, that was one of the first things to come out of these uh, uh, actual images of the sun, that um, the, the radio emission is limb brightened. And so Govind also showed that at a wavelength of 500 megahertz also you see limb brightening of the sun. And this was using observations with an array of antennas uh, uh, at a place near Sydney called Potts Hill. Um, and so what he had to do in order to, so uh, the map that I'm showing you was made with data which was already taken. Uh, after that, he actually built, uh, modified this array to work at a frequency of 500 megahertz. And he was able to show that even at 500 megahertz, you see limb brightening. So one of the things which you need to do to make these arrays work properly is that you have to adjust all the antenna signals so that they are transported in phase. That is the antenna is sitting out somewhere in the field. You've connected it with a coaxial cable and uh, you need to ensure that um, the phase uh, that you receive uh, in your, uh, you know, when you're combining all of the signals, uh, they are actually, uh, for all of the antennas, they are all in phase. And that should include also um, yeah, the uh, any phase which is introduced by the amplifiers and so on and so forth. And so that was actually quite a cumbersome process. And that phase adjustment took many days to do. And again, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of very painful uh, phase adjustment that he did led him uh, to, to sort of make an imp important contribution that we will look at um, in, a, in a little while. So this just is a photograph of the Potts Hills antennas, uh, the ones which he modified to work at 500 uh, megahertz. So after a couple of years in Australia, Govind returned to NPL. And uh, when he returned to NPL, uh, he had uh, actually already uh, reached an agreement with CSIRO that these antennas that he had used in Australia, the pot cell antennas, could be donated to NPL. And so um, they could be used to start up radio astronomy uh, at NPL. But unfortunately, uh, this transfer for various reasons could not be actualized. And, um, uh, you know, radio astronomy um, re really went into a very slow kind of phase at NPL. And much of that group, which had been put together, gradually dispersed. Govind himself decided to continue in radio astronomy in the US. And he first went to Harvard University's radio station 
at Texas, uh, which was at that time the most sensitive uh, system available for radio spectroscopy so of the sun. And uh, that photograph that you see over there is of the antenna that uh, was um, part of the Harvard University Radio Astronomy Station. And Govind is standing in the middle over there in front of that antenna. So the work that he did in that period included discovery of what are now called U-type bursts. And they understood these type bursts, which I've shown you an example over here at the bottom. Uh, uh, it's a plot of basically the frequency of the emission as a function of time. And you can see that the frequency evolves with time. And in this frequency time plane, uh, that evolution has a kind of inverted U-type shape. And uh, it's understood now that that is because these, uh, this burst arises from electrons which rise along the magnetic fields and then loop back towards the sun. And because uh, the density uh, and therefore the, um, the frequency at which these electrons emit varies with height, it leads to this characteristic evolution uh, of the frequency with time. Uh, following uh, his stint at uh, Harvard uh, Observatory, Govan took up a PhD at Stanford. And uh, there he worked with the well-known radio astronomer Ron Bracewell. Uh, and he worked on what is called the Stanford Cross Antenna Array. Uh, so this antenna array, uh, like all antenna arrays, had to be phased. And that was Govan's job early in the morning before he went off for his graduate classes. And as I mentioned, it was a painful and tedious job. And so Govin kept thinking of ways in which uh, this job could be speeded up. And he finally came up with what is called the round trip uh, 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 sort of uh, method for, 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 for phasing antenna arrays. And this cut down the required time dramatically. And that technique is now used in many applications which require synchronization of physically separated equipment. Uh, so that was a very important contribution he made during his PhD days, although his PhD itself uh, was on solar radio emission. And following his PhD, he continued on at Stanford as an assistant professor. But, you know, he had always been keen to return to India. And I think over here, you know, the years he had spent at Allahabad and, you know, the atmosphere and uh, things of pre-independence India all uh, played a very important role. And so, Although he had uh, this position at Stanford, he was quite clear in his mind that he wanted to return to India. And so along with other radio, young radio astronomers, some of whom were part of the NPL group with him earlier, he wrote a proposal for starting a radio astronomy group in India. And that was sent, that proposal was sent to ma several major scientific organizations in India. And it was also sent to several prominent international radio astronomers with a request for them to send an assessment of this proposal to the institutions where the proposal had been sent. And, uh, you know, the most positive response that the group got was from Homi Baba uh, at uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And among other things, Baba wrote in his initial offer that if your group fulfills the ex expectation we have of it, this could lead to some very big equipment and work at radio astronomy in India than we foresee at the present. So I'm just showing you over here uh, two of the people who were part of this group, uh, TK Menon on the left and MR Kundu uh, on the right. And both of them uh, at some later stage to join um, uh, the radio astronomy group at TIFR. So Govind, uh, um, you know, once the offer was there from Homi Baba, um, he resigned from Stanford and moved uh, to TIFR. And he, on the way back, he stopped in the Netherlands, which was another pioneering, uh, you know, that's another place where there was a lot of uh, pioneering effort in radio astronomy. And he met, uh, you know, this very famous uh, Dutch astronomer called Jan Oort, who at that time had, uh, the, you know, the Dutch had just set up a, a large 25 meter dish for studying the H121 centimeter line in, in a place called Twingelo in the Netherlands. And uh, Oot offered uh, to help set up a duplicate of this antenna in India so that uh, the uh, antenna in the Netherlands could observe the northern sky and um, this antenna could focus on the southern sky. But Govind uh, did not really take up uh, that offer. He felt it was more important to carve out a niche um, for Indian radio astronomy that, rather than to follow uh, fashions. And the first uh, 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 telescope that he set up, in fact, was what's called the Kalyan Radio Telescope. And it used the same old Potts Hills antennas, which had finally reached India by that time. 
Uh, he used a novel and much simpler uh, transmission line than had been used uh, in the original. I misspoke earlier when I said it, uh, signals had been transported in a coaxial uh, cable. They had been transported along transmission lines. And uh, uh, Govind used, you know, a novel and much simpler transmission line than what had been used earlier. And, you know, this whole process of setting up uh, this telescope uh, provided training, uh, you know, the training ground for young manpower in radio astronomy. The telescope was set up and it quickly yielded interesting results on the sun. But by the time Govind was already thinking of a much bigger telescope. And to sort of motivate the thinking, uh, I want to go back uh, to something I had mentioned earlier that radio telescopes typically had have uh, angular resolutions, a single dish radio telescope, which are very poor compared uh, to that of the optical telescopes. Right. And uh, that makes it, as I had mentioned earlier, very difficult to identify optical counterparts to radio sources. And so I'm showing you over here, uh, uh, you know, basically, if you uh, if you see a radio source and you ask yourself within the error box uh, uh, of my location of this radio source, how many optical sources are there? You know, can I pick an optical source and say this is likely to be its counterpart? It's actually very, very difficult. So, I, you know, there because a very, very large number of um, sources. Uh, which could be possible counterparts. And to illustrate that, I'm showing you an optical image containing the uh, radio source 3C273, which is a very bright radio source. And uh, I'm showing you, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, an image of a size roughly equal to the resolution of, uh, of a radio telescope in Australia called PARKS, which is a 64 meter radio telescope. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, which uh, in those days was uh, one of the largest radio telescopes. In fact, it is um, uh, uh, the, probably still the largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. So, uh, you know, that optical image, as you can see, contains a very, very large number of sources. So if you're going to ask the question, which one of these sources is actually this bright radio source, it's, it's, it's basically impossible to answer with the information that you have. Uh, you need a much more accurate position of the radio source to start with. And that accurate position was uh, finally determined by the Parkes telescope using a, a technique called lunar occultation. Right? And, and I'll show you something about uh, lunar occultation in the next slide. But once you were able to locate uh, the, uh, you know, pinpoint exactly where in the sky that radio emission was coming from, you could identify the optical counterpart and then quickly understand what, what, what's the nature of the source. And uh, what was seen was that uh, in the optical, the source was really just looks looked like a point source. It looked like a star. And so this was called a quasi stellar object. And uh, we now understand it to be a supermassive black hole. And uh, it was at that time what would be, well, you know, was a record high distance uh, from uh, the Earth, uh, distances which are measured in what's called the redshift. And that redshift was uh, 0.158, which, you know, was uh, an enormously large uh, redshift for those days. So, uh, so this is how they located the source uh, using, as I said, what's called lunar occultation. So, you know, the moon can be approximated as a semi-infinite screen uh, for distant uh, source uh, radio sources. So uh, as the sharp edge of the moon, uh, you know, uh, goes in front of the source, as it occults the source, you, it, you, you get diffraction, you, you get kind of diffraction patterns. And as the lunar edge moves, that diffraction pattern will drift uh, over a fixed location on the Earth. So if you have an antenna at some fixed point on the Earth, as the moon moves, that diffraction pattern will drift over your antenna. And so measuring this uh, uh, pattern would then hence allow you to very precisely locate the source and also measure its angular extent. And that's exactly what has been done with um, with uh, the Parkes telescope. And that is the thing which allowed them to identify the actual location of the source 3C273, following which uh, the optical counterpart could also be identified. So uh, this discovery uh, actually, uh, you know, made uh, a big impact on Govind's thinking and triggered by the possibility of lunar occultation, Govind thought of building a, a telescope to characterize the angular size of a very large number of radio sources. And the idea, the primary driver was to measure the angular size flux relation. Uh, that is, uh, you know, what is the relationship between how bright a source is and how big it is. And that would allow, in principle, one to, to, dif to differentiate between two, at that time, competing models of the universe, the steady state model and the Big Bang cosmological model. But, you know, if you wanted to build this big telescope in order to 
measure the lunar occultation uh, sizes of a large number of you know relatively faint sources there were two major challenges which had to be overcome one the telescope would need to be steered otherwise the number of sources which you could observe would be very limited if you are not able to steer the telescope itself and second of course because you are beginning to look at uh, you know faint sources the telescope would need to be very big you know four times bigger bigger than the largest uh, fully steerable radio telescope at that time so Govind uh, sort of came up to a very innovative solution to these challenges, and that was to build a large cylindrical telescope, a cylindrical parabolic telescope, whose long axis is parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. So it would be located basically on a north-south uh, hill slope, whose gradient is equal to the latitude. And that guarantees then that the long axis of the cylinder is parallel to the rotation axis of the Earth. And by rotating the cylinder around its long axis, you would actually be able to track a source from rise to set. And uh, so that allows you to point in one direction. Pointing in the other direction was done by phasing uh, the, 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 the feed antenna. So that was uh, basically the conceptual uh, concept behind the Uti radio telescope. And he, he worked it out and presented it to Baba, who was very supportive of the project and who also obtained funding for the telescope, as well as an associated inter-university center, which was meant to train students. The engineering challenges were, of course, enormous. Um, and TCE, which was uh, at that time, the, the TCE, which is Tata Consulting Engineers, at that time it was called Tata Abasco, were the ones who made the specialized designs uh, for that telescope. And so, uh, and again, you know, uh, foreign exchange at that time was very, very scarce. So that was another of the engineering challenges. Everything had to be done indigenously. You know, indigenization of components was critical. So components like coaxial cables and n-type connectors were, you know, which are, uh, you know, tiny fiddly uh, things that you will need if you are actually going to you know connect amplifiers to cables and transport signals and so on and so forth were developed in india for the very first time and based on conceptual designs that govind provided and interestingly going back to the mit radiation lab series which he had been using uh, you know from the time when he was working uh, at npl so the challenges as i said were enormous but nonetheless the telescope was made operational in 1970 and the picture I'm showing you here is of the groundbreaking ceremony, and that's Professor M. G. K. Menon, who was at that time the director, since uh, Baba had uh, passed away in a tragic accident, uh, sort of uh, doing the groundbreaking ceremony. So the Uti radio telescope, which was the first really big telescope, uh, radio telescope built in India, is located on a north-south hill slope in Uti, uh, with a slope of about 11 degrees. <clears throat> it's an offset parabolic cylinder about 530 meters into 30 meters across. Um, uh, the offset parabola basically ensures that you have easy access to the line feed, and it also gives you the advantage that there's no blockage of the aperture. And the reflecting surface, if you look at this telescope, you won't see the reflecting surface, and that is because it consists of just stainless steel wires. And so unless the light is just right, you won't actually be able to see it. And as I mentioned, you rotate the cylinder around the wrong axis to track sources in the sky, and you phase uh, the signals from the, you know, the dipole sitting at the feed at the focus to point it in the north sub direction. But the UT radio telescope had a transformative impact on the Indian radio astronomy. <clears throat> it worked on you know, this problem that was, had been identified as a key problem, of course, the angular size flux relation of radio sources. It also did a number of things uh, you know, which uh, had not been originally um, sort of uh, been the drivers for the telescope, including studies of the diffuse interstellar medium of the galaxy using radio recombination lines studies of the heliosphere uh, using scintillation of radio sources, what we call IPS, interplanetary scintillation, studies of pulsars, and so on and so forth. And also, very importantly, it trained a whole generation of radio astronomers and engineers, and it continues to be in regular use today, um, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, a number of upgrades which have happened over the years, including one which is uh, ongoing at the moment. Now, uh, after the UTI radio telescope, uh, the, the group built what was called uh, the UTI synthesis radio telescope. The UTI radio telescope, although it was large, was a single dish radio telescope. So it did not have imaging capability per se, and its angular resolution, as we have been discussing, was quite modest. 
And so in order both to make images and also to have better angular resolution, uh, this uh, the telescope was converted into, uh, or rather there were elements added to the telescope to, to allow it to function as an interferometric array, an array which is capable of making images. So a number of small telescopes uh, were set up around um, the, 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 the main telescope, which were called baby cylinders. Uh, and the signals from these were transported uh, to the uh, central building near the main telescope and combined together to, to create a, uh, you know, a telescope which had an angular resolution of a telescope which was a few kilometers across. Right? That's uh, what we discussed, that the angular resolution would depend on the separation of the two antennas and not on the size of the antennas. The uh, UT Synthesis Radio Telescope was actually operational for a relatively short period of time, but it did a number of imaging studies at 327 megahertz, including, for example, making images like this of the radio emission from nearby galaxies. This is NGC 4631. And, uh, you know, and I think equally importantly, it served as a very useful training ground for, for, for the group to begin to understand how synthesis radio telescopes work and how to actually build them. And that uh, basically led to the next big radio telescope in India. By the mid 1980s, uh, Govind was planning the next big telescope. Uh, there was a step in between, uh, which is called uh, the GERT, the Giant Equatorial Radio Telescope, which I'll talk about towards the end of my talk. But the next big radio telescope that Govind uh, sort of uh, came up with and which was built in India was um, the uh, the GMRT. And given the importance of high angular resolution, it was clear that this new telescope had to be an array, it had to be an interferometric array. The original concept was to have an array of 34 parabolic cylinders spread over 25 kilometers. Uh, and um, that evolved over time uh, until uh, we, you get the uh, configuration of the GMRT that we see today, which I'll um, run through in a moment. But I first want to just talk about this idea of having antennas separated by 25 kilometers. The only existing interferometer of this size uh, at that time was a very large array, and it used um, uh, waveguides to transport signals uh, from each antenna to a central location. So waveguides are these hollow uh, metal tubes, right? And um, so you had these long metal tubes which transported the signal from each antenna uh, the, the radio signal which was received by each antenna, it was transported along these to the central electronics building. Uh, in the VLA, the VLA is located in a desert in New Mexico. Uh, this kind of, uh, you know, way of transporting signals in India is not, is not very practical for India because um, you don't have these large, flat, thinly populated areas where you can think of, you know, burying these uh, waveguides in the ground. So Govind instead decided to use, uh, you know, a technology which was, you know, somewhat nascent at that time, which was optical fibers. And that again was a radical innovation for radio telescopes. <clears throat> so uh, what was the science case? So, you know, the main science case, well, uh, although there were other science cases too, one of the main science cases, uh, you know, is a topic of great interest uh, to this, uh, to people attending this conference which was to uh, detect uh, emission from the 21 centimeter emission from hydrogen in the early universe. At the time that the JMRT was proposed, there were two models for the formation of galaxies. One was called the top-down model, the large objects collapse first and then fragment to form galaxies. The other is the bottom-up model, uh, uh, where small objects collapse first and then merge to form uh, uh, larger objects. And uh, which of these two actually happened depended on the nature of the dark matter in the universe. The top-down model is what you would expect if there was hot dark matter. The bottom-up model is what you would expect if there was cold dark matter. And in, uh, at that time, top-down was uh, uh, somewhat favored over the bottom-up model and massive collapsed objects were predicted to be, uh, the massive collapsed objects which you would form right at the start were also predicted to be very, very flat. They were, they were basically two-dimensional kind of objects, which were called Zeldovich pancakes after the very famous Russian astrophysicist whose photograph I've shown over here, who was the first person to actually show that uh, the, the collapse would happen uh, uh, in such a way that uh, the collapsed objects would be uh, thin and flat. Uh, so, uh, so Govind, of course, had uh, long been interested in detecting each one from the early universe, even before uh, the GMRT uh, uh, sort of came 
uh, came up and uh, one of the pieces of work he did was to guide Ravi Subramaniam's PhD thesis on searching for these pancakes, these protoclusters, uh, very flat protoclusters using the OT radio telescope. And the search for H1 for protoclusters was, as I mentioned uh, a short while ago, a very important part of the JMRT science case. So if you look at the JMRT antennas, the way the array is laid out, and I'm showing that to you over here in this picture, you have uh, 12 antennas which are in a relatively compact configuration, about a kilometer on a size, and the remaining antennas which um, uh, are spread out on uh, along these roughly Y-shaped arms. And uh, so, of course, um, the antennas in the central uh, region, which are relatively close together, would have a different angular resolution than that afforded by the very distant uh, antennas along the Y arms. And these very compact antennas actually had an angular resolution which was well matched to what was expected for the angular size of protoclusters. And if you look at the GMRT proposal, um, uh, it, it actually had a straw man design for a 50 square degree survey uh, aimed at detecting H1 from protoclusters. Um, the GMRT actually, the proposal, if you look at it, it also uh, does talk about the bottom up model. Uh, it, uh, so, you know, they hadn't put all of their eggs in one basket. They did discuss also in case it is a bottom up model, which is right, that is, you have hierarchical structure formation, which is what we believe happens today because uh, cold dark matter, small objects collapse first and hierarchically merge to form bigger ones. Uh, so uh, the JMRT science case also discussed uh, how to constrain the bottom-up model. And as I just said, in this model, the things which collapse, the hydrogen clouds that you get in the early universe would be small. And uh, they would eventually merge together to form bigger and bigger things. So since they are small, the emission from an individual structure would be too faint to detect. However, the collection of collapsed objects which you know would lie within the field of view would lead to increased uh, sort of noise in your emission, right? Because these objects are scattered randomly around your field of view. And so because of that, you get a little additional uh, emission and a little additional noise, uh, quote unquote, noise in your signal. So the, you know, if you pointed at different regions, uh, they would statistically tend to contain different amounts of clouds. And so therefore the, emit the signal that you receive would vary. And the fluctuations uh, were expected to be of the order of 0.5 to 5 Kelvin on scales of 3 to 6 arc minutes. And so the, you know, the science case that was built, the JMRT proposal, actually uh, has a, a little bit of a description on how uh, one could try and constrain the bottom-up model by comparing the noise in a regular observation to the noise at which um, you scramble the delays of the antenna. This is a bit technical, but I won't uh, try and explain it here. So you just try and scramble the, uh, the delays in the antenna antennas uh, to try and work out what is the intrinsic noise of the instrument. So you work out what's the intrinsic noise of the instrument and then uh, you, you check what is the noise when I look at the sky and any excess that you see you, uh, you, you would help you constrain um, uh, you know, how much emission is coming from the sky from these kind of objects. So, and it's probably one of the first proposals I think for a statistical detection of H1 emission at high redshifts. Um, by the time the GMRT actually was constructed, the top-down model was no longer in favor. And uh, so, you know, it was more or less widely believed that uh, the bottom-up model is correct and you would have hierarchical galaxy formation. And the proposed survey for protoclusters, for various reasons, actually never ended up being carried out by the GMRT. Um, but interestingly, you know, just around the same time that the JMRT came up, there was in fact a claim uh, based on observations uh, with the very large array with the VLA in USA of detection of, uh, of H121 centimeter emission from uh, a Zelda witch pancake, um, you know, a large collapsed protocluster in the early universe. And, um, uh, you know, and that's something that Govind uh, actually uh, took a look at uh, uh, along with Kandu Subramaniam. Uh, and so Govind and Kandu actually wrote this paper showing how that signal could arise even in a bottom up model. Uh, however, it finally turned out that the detection itself was probably spurious. Uh, so anyway, so the JMRT, one of the main science cases for which the JMRT was built was uh, the study of H1 uh, from protoclusters in the very early universe. 
And as we saw, by the time the telescope actually got constructed, that science case, uh, pro you know, became a lot less interesting than it had been uh, when the instrument was proposed. And this is actually not very unusual for some parts of the science case of an instrument to be superseded by the time the instrument is actually built. But however, if you know, if you built the instrument to, to be sufficiently capable and flexible, it'll still enable excellent science. And that's exactly what happened with the GMRT. I won't uh, describe any of the science that the GMRT did. I, 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 I expect during the course of the conference, you will be hearing about it. I'll just say a little bit about the GMRT. Uh, it's an array of 30 antennas, each of which is 45 meters in diameter. It was built to a novel cost-effective antenna design. Uh, uh, and this is the brainchild of Govind Swaroop. It's called SMART. Um, yeah, so again, over here, if you look at the uh, reflecting surface of the antennas, you don't see it. And that's because it's a wire mesh and the backup structure itself is extremely light. And so instead of having, a, you know, a large number of uh, support structures, which would support aluminum panels shaped to be a parabola, you instead have wire ropes, which are tensed uh, to just the right amount to give the uh, give a parabolic shape. And then you just stretch the mesh across it. And that was Govind's brainchild. And that's the thing which allowed the GMR2 to be built uh, at, uh, you know, very modest cost. It's located about 80 kilometers from Pune, and uh, it's uh, you know been in operation for for more than 20 years now, and it was at that time and it remains still one of the most sensitive radio telescopes in the world at most of its frequencies of operation. I'll uh, given the time, I'm just going to skip over more details of the GMRT. Uh, maybe I'll just mention this, uh, that, uh, you know, the GMRT has an open sky policy. Uh, astronomers from all over the world can submit proposals to the radio, to, 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 the, uh, to the telescope. It's over subscriptions, typically a factor of two and three, with time being roughly divided equally between Indian and foreign astronomers. And again, given the time, I probably uh, should not get into details of the upgrade of the GMRT. I mentioned that the GMRT was one of the most sensitive radio telescopes in the world at the time when it was commissioned. And we are now, of course, 20 years plus past that time. And the reason the GMRT continues to be one of the most sensitive telescopes in the world is because um, a large number, a lot of work has gone into upgrading the telescope. So the telescope that we have now is, is very, very different from what we, you know, what one had uh, earlier, as far as all of the electronics and the digital signal processing is concerned. Pretty much all that remains uh, the same is the steel and the concrete of the telescope. And even there, uh, you know, there have been things which have been upgraded from the early days. So yeah, so I just wanted to show this picture also the, that the GMRT, uh, uh, this is the launch of the upgraded GMRT uh, about two years ago, and uh, it was launched at the hands of, uh, of Govind Swaroop, who you see over here with Bina Swaroop in the, in the middle of the picture. Um, and again, maybe I should just given the time skip over this of uh, the details of the upgrade, but I just would like very much to mention this. That very recently, the GMRT has was accorded an IEEE, the uh, IEEE milestone status, and this is the um, the citation uh, uh, from the IEEE uh, for for uh, the IEEE milestone status. Uh, I won't read it out, but I, I would like to also just mention that it's only the third such milestone in India. The other two being uh, uh, the work by C. V. Raman, Sir C. V. Raman and the work by uh, uh, Acharya J.C. Bose uh, on microwaves. Right? So it is actually you know, a very significant uh, uh, achievement for the GMRT and a real tribute, I think, to Govind Swaroop and the team uh, that uh, you know, he put together to build the telescope, as well as all the people who worked on the telescope over the years uh, to keep it at the forefront um, of, uh, to ensure that it stays at the forefront of radio astronomy. So I did say, I'll say a little bit about, uh, you know, a, a step between the UT radio telescope and the GMRT, which was called the Giant Equatorial Radio Telescope. And this, uh, you know, uh, fits into a theme uh, of, uh, of Govind's uh, collaborative nature. Govind uh, actually, as you would see, he's, he, he started his training in Australia, continued in the US, and he, he always had this kind of international perspective. 
And uh, so uh, one of the things that he, he had sort of, uh, you know, tried very hard to get going uh, in, 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 in sort of the mid to late 70s was this, what he called the Giant Equatorial Radio Telescope, which was a large international radio telescope, uh, a cylindrical parabola again, uh, two kilometers long, 50 meters in size. It would be located at the equator of the Earth. So once again, you know, you can track sources by rotating along a single axis. Uh, there was significant interest from Kenya. Uh, the seed funding was also provided by UNESCO and TIFR provided funding for developing detailed drawings um, with the help of Tata Consulting Engineers. And so the final concept, which um, uh, you know was sort of put forward, was uh, this large uh, cylindrical telescope, two, two kilometers into 50 meters in size. But it also had several smaller antennas separated by up to 14 kilometers away so that it could operate as a synthesis telescope and make images of the sky. Well, the project finally, for various reasons, uh, you know, did not come to fruition, but it did, uh, you know, sort of play an important role in seeding the idea and building up sort of the capacity for building a large radio telescope in India, namely the GMRT. The other thing I wanted to mention in this context was that Govind was one of the first people to make a proposal for a large, again, international uh, interferometer with a collecting area of the order of a kilometer square to observe neutral hydrogen at high redshifts. I won't actually read um, through uh, this bit over here. It was published uh, in, uh, in uh, a paper which Govind uh, uh, sort of presented at a conference in 1994. But it sort of just works out, uh, you know, in detail, the kind of telescope that you would need if you wanted to detect H1 uh, from individual galaxies uh, or from, uh, you know, uh, other larger collapsed objects in the universe um, at redshifts of three or higher. And he was also uh, one of the first people, along with Ron Eakers, uh, to actually try and get a formal start to the process. Um, he, along with Ron Eakers, proposed to set up a large telescope working group in the ERC uh, meeting of 1993. This working group was, in fact, uh, set up, and it's one of the first formal steps uh, which led to the setting up of this square kilometer array. And the final thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, Govind's role in student training. Uh, as I mentioned, he, he, you know, probably partly because of, uh, you know, the excellent uh, teachers he had when he was an undergraduate. From very early on, Govind realized the importance of having trained manpower, of having scientists and engineers, um, you know, who were uh, sort of uh, able to take the science program of the country forward. And uh, as I mentioned, the whole generation of these people were trained at the UT Radio Telescope. And you, there was also a very fresh uh, team, young team of engineers, which was uh, recruited at the time that the GMRT was designed. Uh, and in addition, of course, Govind uh, trained a large number of PhD students. Um, he also played a very important role in setting up the joint uh, astronomy program uh, in India, which is a program which is running to date. Uh, uh, among the institutions in Bangalore, the astronomy institutions in Bangalore, a multi-institution program, which has, you know, produced a very distinguished host uh, of, uh, of, of Indian astronomers. And, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate science education, as I said, was always an important concern for him. As I said, uh, the UT radio telescope, when it had been first sort of uh, sort of funded and pushed by Baba. It was also supposed to be part of an inter-university center. That, that part actually didn't uh, finally materialize. But after retiring from TIFR, Govind devoted a lot of effort in trying to set up new institutions for undergraduate education in science and engineering because he felt that the existing institutions didn't quite, uh, you know, take this integrated um, approach to science and engineering. And Govind's proposal finally took shape with the help of many others um, uh, in the form uh, of the establishment uh, of the ICERs, um, uh, of which, uh, as you are aware, there are a, a whole network of them in India. So I think this is uh, all I had wanted uh, to say. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jairam. Um, an excellent presentation of a life and work that uh, should be celebrated and uh, at different level we are trying to do that uh, with our capabilities um, so i guess uh, we can take a few uh, questions and comments so uh, 
participants here in the Zoom who has any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Those who are um, uh, in the YouTube channel, who has joined through the YouTube channel, I see there are about 30 uh, participants there. Um, they can also put their questions or comments in the comment box and we will uh, convey it here. So, uh, floor is open for the participants for their questions. Yes. Um, this, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Jaram. Uh, wasn't very sure I might have missed that part uh, where you uh, did you mention uh, uh, OSRT? Uh, I, I, I did mention OSRT, uh, but I had only one slide, so it, it probably went by quickly. Um, I did uh, have a slide on the OSRT. Because that, that had a very important yes. lesson that uh, I think uh, Govind carried very swiftly to. Um, you know, realize uh, things better in the GMRT. Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, it served as a very, very useful uh, training ground. I raise my hand in this, building. I say. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, I agree, Daesh, completely. That is a very important point uh, that, um, you know, in addition to the science that it did, it also played this very important role in sort of getting people to understand how to build and operate synthesis telescopes. Like, what should I say? Sorry, there's some other question. I think Chanda uh, may have a question. Um, no, I just wanted to actually say, Jairam, that it was a really very informative talk. And as usual, I feel inspired by what Sorup could do in one life. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for uh, you know telling about information which I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, you know, I think um, we. I know for sure that I myself tend to take a lot of things for granted and I definitely find it useful to remind myself again and again of all the work that uh, Govind and all of these other people did, um, you know, which enabled uh, what's happening today. Very inspiration. Kabiru? Yeah. Hi, Jairam. This is yeah, a hi, very nice talk. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, was there in the initial proposal of GMRT was this uh, uh, Govind initially planned this 50 megahertz also at some point or what was the 50 point? megahertz yeah yes I believe uh, no I I think it had a smaller number of frequencies at that time and I don't recall if 50 megahertz was there in the very first proposal or not I, I can take a look I'll have to cross check that um, okay. it was there at a later stage but whether it was there from the very beginning at uh, in 1984 I'm not 100% sure I'll have to cross check okay, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, even the L band was not there. Uh, to begin uh, right. Uh, L band came in later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? I don't see any uh, question or comment in the YouTube channel. So I guess there is nothing from there. Um, Maybe I can ask. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jera. Hi. So, uh, what happened to this baby cylinders in UP? Ah, they're still there, actually. Um, yeah, so if you look around, you will uh, you will see some of them which are still on the RAC campus. They are not in very good shape, um, but they are there. Um, they are not mechanically maintained or anything anymore. Uh, they're, so they are just there, and um, you know they are big, they are rusting at some level. And uh, the ones which were more distant, I think the land also has now been returned to the forest department. So that land is no longer part of um, RAC. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, the next time you're in Uti, uh, once conditions permitted, uh, you could uh, take a look at some of these baby cylinders. Some of them actually, because things grow so fast in Uti, uh, you'll, need a, you'll need a machete to reach there. <laughs> Prava, yes. Yeah, hi, hi there. Um, yeah. This is Prava. Very yeah. nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so I was just wondering whether in those early days um, there was any collaboration between the optical astronomy in India and the radio astronomy group. Were uh, there like common science interests yeah. across different frequencies? 
Yeah, so I'm, <clears throat> so, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm not probably the best person to answer that question um, because, you know, by the time I joined this group, uh, it was, I mean, although I was in UT for a little while yeah, during summers, by the time I joined the group, I was, uh, you know, they were here in Pune. But I am aware of at least one, there may be more, um, but I am aware at least of the following work which happened, um, you know, with, with the help of Venu Bapu and other people at IIA which was that uh, the, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, one of the things that the uh, lunar occultation was about was about identifying uh, optical counterparts, right, uh, of radio sources. So you locate yeah. the source accurately, then you want to know what is its optical counterpart. And so mm -hmm. uh, what used to be done was that I think IIA had um, the, uh, uh, the digital, um, not the digital, of course, it had the Palomar Sky Survey, the glass plates, mm -hmm. and uh, it also had a plate measuring machine, which I think may have been at Kodai Canal or something like that. Okay. And uh, so there was uh, uh, this person, uh, C.R. Subramanya, whose job it was once there were coordinates to go to Kodai Canal and sit with that plate measuring machine, which, um, you know, I think Vainu Bapu had very kindly allowed uh, people from here to use uh, to, to try and identify what the radio sources were. Mm -hmm. But probably some of the old timers would know much better than me, you know, what all, uh, you know, collaborative work went on. And I'm sure there were other examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. There is a comment from uh, YouTube channel from Devraj Power. Very informative talk. Thank you. Uh, and a question from uh, Alak Rai saying, Desh mentioned OSRT. What exactly were the technical lessons from OSRT to help GMRT? Maybe, Jaram, if you can uh, elaborate okay. a bit yeah. on that. Yeah, so um, so that, again, you know, uh, I'm not really the best person because, uh, you know, I, I was... Um, uh, you know, I'm not, um, I joined the group much later. And so probably somebody like Anant might be able to point more at more things. But one of the things I could, for example, point out was that uh, the OSRT used uh, radio links to try and communicate between the distant antennas and the uh, central antenna. So the signals were sent on radio links. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, that experience was one of the things which um, have, uh, probably uh, helped cement in Govind's mind that he wanted a more, uh, you know, he needed a better bandwidth, needed a better way of transporting signals between the distant antennas and moved, um, you know, and uh, they moved uh, quite clearly and firmly towards optical fibers instead, even though that technology had never been used in radio astronomy before. There probably are other uh, uh, things uh, which, um, you know, engineering-wise were important lessons learned. <clears throat> and I think just uh, astronomy-wise, it was uh, very useful for people to actually begin to get familiar with the techniques of, of radio astronomy, with, you, with, you, with dealing with visibilities, with converting visibilities into images, all these uh, things, uh, you know, with, with the sort of phasing and calibrating arrays, uh, all of these things which are not, uh, you know, uh, at the engineering level, but which are nonetheless required uh, to, to, uh, to sort of get uh, images out. These are things that the group got trained in and various people got trained in with the OSRT. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe Desh uh, could add more. He, he's, he, he's probably a yeah, bit I'm, more familiar with uh, the OSRT to GMRT. Yes, yes, I have to myself. hear the discussion yeah. where the, the jump from dashes to dishes happened. Yes. Uh, I think the experience and the calibratability of the, uh, the cylindrical dish versus uh, uh, a cylindrical uh, parabola uh, versus uh, this this the paraboloid dish uh, happened, uh, I think, uh, a major lesson came from this array. Yeah, okay. from the lessons they learned on trying to calibrate this array. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't see any other hand raised here. Uh, there is uh, more questions from uh, YouTube uh, channel. I will just go through those. Um, um, so there is relaying from Narendra Patra. I just wanted to mention that Govind published his last paper at the age of 90 in 2019, um, quite inspirational. And then there is a question from uh, Allah Reagan, what about the correlator? So I think this is in the context of OSRT to GMRT. Uh, he asked, what, what about the correlator? Was there 
like learning yeah. about the correlator yeah i i'm sure there is but i must confess i do not know exactly what the osrt correlator was like and i um i, I mean the jmrt correlator was of course a huge jump uh, over the osrt correlator and um, so uh, uh, I, I know that there were various issues which had to be resolved over there, but the learning from OSRT, I'm not very sure about that. And again, maybe I, I don't know if Desh, who might have some memories of uh, some discussions at that time. Yeah, just referring to specifically the correlator aspect, um, um, just wanted to remind ourselves that the technology was also changing very fast. So even if it was not a, may not have been a lesson from OSRT, there was already a case for building certain, uh, you know, these correlators in certain ways. And uh, FX versus XF uh, kind of uh, uh, choices, they certainly were uh, uh, something that you can mention as uh, being learned from the OSRT. Yeah, yeah, as you went from a few number of antennas to a large number of antennas, probably they became clear that we have to go to FX. Mm -hmm. So, Jairam, I have a question. You mentioned about the VLA uh, uh, detection, you know, of the uh, the Zeldovich pancake uh, signal, yes. and then you commented that the the detection was probably uh, spurious. Is, yeah. is it not sort of uh, uh, ruled out as a spurious signal already, or is it is yes. is there still some doubt? Um, no, I don't think that's a doubt. I think that it's widely regarded as a spurious signal. Uh, uh, you know, but I tend to, <laughs> I, I tend to to understate okay, these sort okay. of things. But yes, uh, I don't believe that that signal is regarded by anybody right now as genuine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't see any other question from the YouTube channel. Is there? So uh, last call. Is there any other question from the participants here? Can I ask a question? Co-host may not be able to raise your hand, but you can just unmute and. Maybe yeah. no, they, they had a question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is a this is a question, Jairam. You can certainly answer. You are the best person to answer. Uh, what was your first interaction with Govin, and what was the most exciting thing that you remember in several meetings that you would have had? Uh, okay. uh, the second, uh, I'll, uh, maybe I'll, I'll I'll have to think about what was the most exciting thing that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you know, Govind is just. Full of enthusiasm and infectious enthusiasm. No, that's why it's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult to pin down. I mean, if you met Govind, he always had this, you know, this idea, and you know, he 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 quite often convince you that, you know, this is it kind of thing. You know, we should all go out and uh, just uh, work on this. I mean, because he was just so full of energy. My first meeting with Govind, I remember very clearly. I was uh, an undergraduate student. I had. Uh, come to Uti to work on, um, you know, on uh, to work on radio astronomy, because one of my teachers, who some of you may be familiar with, is also a very old time uh, radio astronomy engineer called uh, N.C. Mathur, who passed away um, some time ago. <clears throat> uh, so he had, um, you know, when I was chatting to him, he said, look, if you're interested in these sort of things, you should go to Uti. And um, so I'd gone to Uti. And uh, for those of you who are, uh, uh, you know, familiar with the place, I had taken a bus, uh, the municipal bus, uh, you know, the jam-packed municipal bus with my suitcase uh, from uh, the Uti bus station to Muthurai village. And on my trip uh, over there, the, the handle of my suitcase broke. And so I was in Muthurai village with this um, suitcase, which I had packed for a couple of months and with no handle. And so I was sort of somehow or the other, I carried it up from <clears throat> Muthurai to the main uh, uh, building and you know I, I thought <laughs> although I was much younger then I was pretty convinced uh, several times that I'm just going to fall down and die over here but I finally reached that building and I said I you know dumped my suitcase and said I need to meet uh, Professor Swaroop and so I was sent up to his office and the first thing he did when he saw me was he said you look very tired why don't we go have a cup of tea and, you know, I, I was just very, very touched by that, uh, that whole thing. And I feel in a way it sort of symbolizes Govind also that he, he really, you know, was a people person. He was very connected to people. He was very concerned, I think, about people. And, um, 
you know, the first thing he did when he saw me was, just, you know, literally, I mean, and I'm just a, you know, a summer student who's, uh, who's, you know, he's never seen before. I'm just there for a couple of months, but he says, you look tired. Why don't we go to the canteen and have a cup of tea? And that's exactly what he did. He took me down to the canteen. He had a cup of tea and he chatted to me about things. And I'm sure many people have similar stories of, of you know, of, of, of going just uh, yeah, thanks. I'm so sorry to hear uh, yeah. my mentor as well, uh, Professor N.C. Mathur, is no more. Uh, yeah, yeah, he passed I, away uh, about uh, a few months ago. I see. Yeah, I didn't know. But, yeah. That is, um, uh, there was an obituary on the web, I'll, uh, which uh, Yashman had located. I will mail you. Yeah. Please, please do. I'll, I'll mail you the link. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is uh, another comment from Alakra in uh, YouTube channel. Thank you, Jairam. And this very nice talk by Jairam. We all agree to that. And uh, is there any more question from the participants? A final call? I don't see any other hand raised. Um, if not, uh, then we can um, close this session. Let's all uh, thanks Jairam for this uh, very interesting, nice talk. Um, since most of you cannot actually unmute i will just clap on behalf of everyone and um, with that i uh, once again um, uh, extend uh, my gratitude to jairam for agreeing uh, to give this uh, special public lecture um, thanks a lot thank you so is there any announcement from the organizers i i don't think there is anything i guess we all um, we will see all the participants um in the morning in the session tomorrow afternoon yeah sure thank you thank you everyone yeah. Yeah.